Hi everyone, I'm Mara Webster with SAG After Foundation and thank you so much for tuning in to another one of our conversations at home today. I want to continue reminding everyone tuning in and watching these videos that the SAG After Foundation is a nonprofit organization and we are currently continuing to raise funds for a COVID-19 emergency assistance fund. This is helping to support actors who are currently out of work due to all of the closed film and television productions with things like paying utility bills and making rent right now. So please check out the details below this video and consider supporting if you're able to in any way at all. Um, today we are joined by such a wonderful group to talk about the Netflix series You. Uh, we have Penn Badgley, Victoria Pedretti, and uh, creator and writer Sarah Gamble joining us today. And I want to just kind of start by asking you guys, when was the last time the three of you were in a room? Because obviously right now you would probably be going out and doing a lot of these interviews together in person, and I imagine it's, it's been a little while. Yeah. When's the last time we saw each other? Over oh, six months ago. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't recall what it would have been. I mean, I was thinking like when we wrapped this season mm -hmm. two, but it must have been after that, too. I saw you once in New York, Penn, for a I panel. saw you, but I'm trying to think about how all of us... When all were, of when us, no. All Victoria, us? I've missed you so much. Yeah, <laughs> I haven't seen either of you guys in a very long time. I was... Mm -hmm. Oh, gosh. It's... Yeah, I'm excited to get back to the show and everything, but mm -hmm. that's, we have to wait a little bit for that. <laughs> Well, I'm glad that we were at least able to get you guys together on the internet, even if it's not in person right now. And, and Sarah, I wanted to start by asking you about the process in writing the show this season, because, you know, obviously when you were first mapping it out and creating these characters and, and adapting the books, you know, we didn't know who these characters were at the point and watching it, mm -hmm. we didn't have any expectations. So did that kind of shift and evolve any of the conversations that you and the rest of the writers were having as you thought about the way that, you know, we now understand these characters and have ideas ourselves about how they might respond to certain situations? Yeah, huge. Hugely, hugely. I mean, when we wrote the pilot, we had no idea who would play Joe Goldberg. And when you, having an actor completely transforms the process of writing because it, I think it instantly becomes a collaboration and the writers write towards the actor's strengths and the actor finds more and more of the character with each script. And obviously we talk about it a lot too. And, you know, um, it's, it's actually been a little bit interesting. We're in the room right now writing season three and uh, you know, we're more than halfway through. We're breaking episode seven of 10 right now. And usually by this point, we know who the actors are. Usually we've been through a casting process. We have this entire cast that we're gonna surround Penn and Victoria with. And um, they're still like, uh, you know, A-list movie stars in my head that I think of as placeholders until we get the casting. So. I don't know how that's going to affect the season, but it's going to be a little bit different. Yeah. And then for you, Penn, what was that experience in terms of the way that you prepared coming into season two versus season one, where you were creating this character from scratch, you know, with the scripts and kind of going off into your own world. But again, you know, this time you've had the opportunity to, to live and breathe within Joe. So how did that process look for you in the way that you prepared with the scripts this season? Um, I, well, you know, I think as an actor, you're really never creating anything from scratch. It might feel that way, but the more you learn to trust what's on the page, I think, the, the easier your job becomes. And then also, I think maybe the more spontaneous you can become. And so for me, I think some of the hardest work was in season one for me to just approach this person for the first time. The second time, I think I knew what I was in for and I was able to enjoy it more. Um, and uh, you know, finding, finding ways to make Joe's um, psychosis, whatever you want to call it, you know, his, his, the, in a way, his very predictable mental and physical habits, um, to make those spontaneous and to make those new every time, I'm sure is the same case for Sarah and the writer's room. You know, it's like, it's just, yeah, you do have to find it fresh every time it's happening, every time he doesn't see himself, every time he's killing someone again, you know? I mean, these, these, these things are, are a lot to take on and you can't treat it like it's just a foregone conclusion. So I think for me, it's quite, it, it's, it's a lot of fun to get into the, the kind of mental and spiritual headspace for that. 
Yeah, and then Victoria, you know, coming in for the first time in season two, um, I know that The Haunting of Hill House was kind of the first pr large professional television set that you'd been on just before you went into making this. And I was, I was curious about the things that you really learned and, and took away from that experience of developing a character arc in a different way for television that you were able to pull into playing love on you. Hmm. Yeah, it was my first experience working on a television series. And I learned a lot even beyond you know, developing a character arc, I was learning about the way in which a set operates. Um, and I don't know, I think, I think you, your process is constantly developing and it has to change on an almost daily basis because you, the work is spiritual and you come every day with a different, um, with a different thing going on within yourself and you have to make that work within the character and within the whatever's happening in that day for them. Um, and I think that that was the thing I got the most from haunting because in terms of like doing research and the way in which you analyze a script and stuff like that, I that's constantly being, um, re-explored but I did a lot of that work in college when I was um, studying and I really uh, think I benefited from having four years of being able to practice and nobody's ever gonna see it <laughs> um, so <laughs> uh, I think what I what I got a lot from haunting uh, had a lot had, had to do with a lot more than just you know, exploring an arc over a long period of time. Yeah, and then obviously this season, you know, for all of you, we saw the shift to LA and there were a lot of new characters being introduced. And, and I was curious about, you know, how that shift changed the, the makeup and the environment on set and the way that you all thought about telling the story because it's putting your central character in such a different situation where he's in a space that he doesn't necessarily feel as comfortable and as home. So... I mean, that's the fun is to put the, to lovingly torture your characters in a certain kind of way. I mean, the more conflict, the better. Um, going into season two, we just, we had Penn. We know, you know, the show sort of revolves around this character getting into new situations and um, uh, trying to be better, I would say. Penn, I don't know if you agree, but yeah, I think he tries trying. to be better. Yeah, he fails, <laughs> but he's, he's trying, he's trying. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, it was really fun. I mean, from a production standpoint, it was challenging because it was sort of like starting from scratch with a new show. When you move production to another city, your entire crew changes. So um, the learning curve is a little steeper than, than some second season shows. But, you know, luckily we had the core group of writers and we had Penn coming to season two. And now we're much luckier going into season three because, um, you know, spoiler alert, we have Penn and Victoria. <laughs> So we uh, had, you know, a lot more to build on um, as we move into, you know, our next strange world that they'll be inhabiting. Yeah, and I, I love the way that in the past, you, you know, Sarah, you've talked about how Joe is very much this antithesis and breakdown of the romantic archetype and that there's behavior mm -hmm. in movies and television shows over decades that's supposed to be romantic but is actually troublesome and that he's a way of breaking that down. And, and I was curious for, for you and Victoria in, in developing this character in, in love, if, if you viewed her in the same way, because, you know, we see her in this like very romantic way at the beginning before we know all the details about who she really is. I mean, for me, yeah, definitely. She's the woman that can take anything. She accepts all behaviors. She's all loving. She's, she's, she, and many people have talked about how she's like this dream woman and, you know, that she doesn't like challenge him, that she doesn't expect him to heal. She just expects to be able to take care of him. Uh, so yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> it's a funny thing with this show because the, the collaboration that we're all having to tell this story is so different than the job that Penn and Victoria do when they inhabit the characters, because, you know, the, the story functions on a couple of levels. It functions sincerely as a romantic story between these two. And yes, Victoria's character, you know, wants to take care of Joe and wants to take care of everyone in her life. But the three of us, when we're talking about it, we know that this is functioning on that other level you're talking about as well. So when we started the season, um, you know, introducing the character of love, we talked a lot about how, um, 
you know, we were going to start from further away and get closer and closer in as the season went on, because your way into these characters is through Joe's eyes. And through Joe's eyes, when we see love, at first she's absolutely perfect. And then as we get closer and closer, we start to meet more of the human that um, Victoria, you know, has been inhabiting. And Pat, I know that when you first took on this role, you, you've talked about how you didn't actually find it to be a useful tool to study the specific psychosis of, of this behavior. And I was just curious about why that felt like an important choice to you to really just focus more on the scripts and the emotional side and the motivation that you saw there. Um, it might just have been my naivete. <laughs> it might have been um, any number of things, but it's what I did. And it's, it clearly has worked a lot. Um, on a certain level. And then on another level, I think, as I mentioned before, like, I think finding, because the truth is with, with someone like Joe, he, he can't be reasonably expected to change. Um, so actually, I think it's going to become more important for me to understand uh, the ins and outs of the psychosis, like the real psychological state of somebody who's capable of this. I mean, I've learned along the way a lot and I've intuited a lot. Um, uh, but I, I think I'm interested in that now more than ever. Um, he's also gonna be, well, actually I was gonna say something that might be spoiled. Well, I, I don't know what's gonna happen actually. That's the truth, but I'm imagining him going into, uh, you can bleep this out, I guess, whatever, into a fa family setting, right? Like into a, home where he's at least I mean we know that Victoria's coming with them right so yeah I don't uh, know either. <laughs> yeah I mean these people are trying to be together and and uh or rather they feel like they're forced to be together now mm -hmm. um so he's gonna have to grapple with this on another level I think um so so I am I, I'm always interested in the psychological state of a person and like isn't it. he starting to analyze himself in his psychological state? You know what I mean? Like, when it comes to love, I feel like I cannot deal with her, like, prescribed diagnoses at all because she's so unaware of herself mm -hmm. uh, that it doesn't really serve her perspective because she's not thinking about those things. That's true, actually. And now Joe really is. I think particularly in season two, he's thinking about them a lot more. And on one level, he is changing them. On one level, he is getting better. On another level, he's, he's, he's not yet. Um, so, I, you know, I mean, I think for me, I'm an introspective person and I read a lot. Um, I, I, I read a lot of science-based literature um, and I'm really fascinated with consciousness and neuroscience. Um, uh, <laughs> It sounds far more impressive than the reality is, but you know, I, I read a lot about that anyway. So I think I think um, there's a lot that I'm imbibing. But probably for season three, I do want to understand the state of a of a serial killer more. Go figure. <laughs> And then Sarah and Victoria, I wanted to ask you about the journey to that reveal in, in Love's character because, you know, obviously at the beginning of, of the season, you don't have all of the scripts written, so you don't have every single minute detail, but you know where it's going and you know who she is. So I was curious about the way that the two of you worked collaboratively together to really develop that and, and have moments throughout the show which are like tiny nuanced beats, which once you have the reveal, just really come together and, and make sense for everyone watching. I mean, I, I, I had a, I was told that there would be a large reveal at the end. I knew that 40 was going to die. I knew that like I was going to kill people, but I didn't really know how or in what order these things were going to happen. So um, I think when exploring a lot of these scenes, I found myself just playing the scene with the motivation that I found um within what was already being told um she happens to be kind of a maniac so i think you can read <laughs> like little beats and nuances if you want to see it because she's a little un she's unhinged um <laughs> so i think i was more playing somebody that you cannot predict somebody who could you know who could switch emotions very quickly um, more than I was uh, pinpointing particular 
uh, or, you know, trying to, uh, what's the word? Uh, well, leave crumbs to predict the future. You, you know what I mean? And how did you want to infiltrate that into the way that you were writing the scripts as you were continuing to construct the season while it was already in progress, Sarah? I think that the contract we kind of had among ourselves because yeah, all of the scripts weren't written yet. We had an idea of where we wanted to go. We told the actors, you know, we have this idea for a reveal at the end and we can't lay out every detail of it yet because we're still working on it. That's just the schedule that we're on. So I think that the trust that has to be between us is, you know, I promised I wouldn't make it impossible when she got there, <laughs> that, that the choices she was making along the way were gonna add up to this. So essentially the conversation we had was about how, you know, we're gonna reveal that love has done some crazy shit, essentially. Um, and that she's not really the person Joe thinks she is, per se, but I, I promise she's not a completely different character than we're writing from scene to scene. And if something uh, doesn't seem to add up or if you're going in a direction that goes away from that, we'll just talk about it. So I think when you're telling a long form story that you're creating along the way, and it's not, all, it's not like going to shoot a film where you, you have your 90 or 100 pages and you know what all of them are, that's kind of the relationship that has to exist between the writers and the actors where we just promise we'll keep talking about it and we won't let the actors go to a place that would screw them up later, that we will continually inform them as we make those discoveries so that we enable them to do their work and, um, you know, and stay on a track that will make sense in their process. And there's yeah. kind of a joy in that because it keeps it alive, you know, the ability to come every day, throw yourself into your work and then have more of it revealed to you. I, 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 I enjoyed that process because it also allows you to focus on where you are in the story yeah, yeah that's actually part of the reason why i you know for all the research and study i might do it, it really comes down to just being present with the words with what's happening in the story you know i mean that's what that is what actually everyone in life is struggling to do and someone who's capable of serial murder is actually struggling to do it too <laughs> and trying maybe <laughs> Maybe. Um, so, you know, so the truth <laughs> is knowing what's coming and knowing, knowing, uh, knowing the psychological parameters that we think exist for somebody who has this pattern of behavior isn't always helpful as an actor to make it interesting for people to really connect to what he's doing. I think what, I, what I've said before is that a lot of the times I sort of cast aside this idea that it should be some clinical portrayal of somebody who's real because I just invest in what he's saying and and, and that in some ways seems to work. I think, I think at best that dynamic between all of us is what works so well for this show. Because if it was, um, if it didn't balance, I think like humor and levity uh, the way that it does, you know, I mean, it might not be what it's become. It might not be the thing that people want to watch the way they have, you know, it, 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 it might be like, and even all the devices that it serves to be, like the conversations that it starts, the way we think about the tropes that we see in, in romantic comedies and television series, what have you. You know, if it was, if Joe was like disgusting to watch in every true way at all times, like we wouldn't be able to do that. We wouldn't be able to actually enjoy the process. We probably wouldn't be able to have the sort of conversation we're having, I think, you know. I mean, so there's something very interesting with, uh, I think casting aside some of these notions of of, um, of a more, I, yeah, again, the word that I use is clinical, like a more clinical portrayal. And it's more true to life. Nobody is a yeah. diagnosis walking around. Mm -hmm. That's certainly how we approach it. I mean, when the writers talk about it, I think just in our culture, we're really fascinated with people who have the uh, capacity to murder and probably more people I talk to than not have read books about serial killers or sociopathy. Oh, totally. And, and the, that, the whole writer's room is full of people like that. And my mom is a psychiatrist who worked in the forensic system for a while. Um, and we're all really clear that we're not writing, we're not writing a case study. We're writing a, a story about people who have the capacity to do this. And if you, I think if you ask my mother or any of those psychiatrists she, that she works with, if somebody comes in and they have, some of these characteristics, but some characteristics you've never seen before, what do you do? They probably say we treat the person. And luckily, 
you know, the, the purpose of the show is not to cure love or cure Joe. It's to explore what's going on with them and, and, and tell a story about them. So um, we don't need to tie all of those things up in a bow. We just need to kind of, as a, as a group, as a team, we need to sort of discover them as we go along. I love it. And then, you know, with, with Penn and Victoria, with the way that the two of you are talking about your approach to your characters and, and really focusing on that human aspect and the emotional aspect, I was interested in, in the way that your working styles as actors and the way that you approach your craft really lent itself to each other, because it sounds like you're very much on the same page in the way you're thinking about this instinctu instinctually versus kind of a more clinical way. And so I was curious about the way that that really lent itself to the way that you work together on set and really built out that relationship together. Um, yeah, I think you're right that like there's there's something about what we do that is like mutually beneficial. And at the same time, I experienced Victoria as a, as a, because she had that time that she referenced before, you know, being in, I think it was, was it conservatory? Yeah, it was a conservatory. What it, yeah. I really came to respect her, um, like her discipline and desire to, uh, uncover the art in every moment and 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 i mean i try to do the same absolutely and then you know on like the 93rd day of shooting something maybe you have a hiccup right and and so i found that quite inspiring and and it yeah i mean i think like some overly wrought portrayal would get really tiresome after a while. And there is something to both of these characters where we were able to, I think, uh, just really dial into how much they, they, they want to love. Not even necessarily each other. They, yeah, they want to love each other. But the truth is they, they're, they're obsessed with this idea and this fantasy mm -hmm. of love. So, there, so you can just like throw yourself into that kind of is the way they do. And I mean, yeah, I think we, we did develop a very significant like creative relationship while, while we were doing this. Cause it's also not easy. It's not easy to play these two people um, and have fun, which I think is an important part of the process in order to have it be spontaneous and read as such to, to the audience. Definitely. Yeah, I think it's definitely nice to be able to enjoy the process. Um, and I think that I, I was able to do that. I think we talk very easily with one another. We're definitely coming from a similar perspective in terms of not wanting to, even though we're exploring these tropes, we still don't want to present stereotypes. You know, we still want to, it to feel like when you walk out onto the street, you could come into contact with these people. You know, obviously they're very extreme um, and there is an element of fantasy to all of this, even in the way they're perceiving the things around them. Um, but I think there is this really beautiful thing between them that they're exploring this concept of love that they've been taught um, in a way that doesn't really um, even benefit them. Like, do we think that Joe at any moment is like content and feel safe? Probably not. Um, and I think love experiences this, a similar thing. Um, and that's sad. <laughs> so I think that there is something really beautiful to this, to this bond of these two people really uh, fighting to, to understand something very foreign to them. Yeah, and then Sarah, I actually wanted to ask you about your work with all the directors on the show because, you know, obviously there's multiple directors coming in and out throughout the season and I loved seeing that the majority are actually women. There's actually amazing parity between men and women um, and how you as the showrunner really work with each of them to make sure that there is that consistency, not just in the tone of the show, but also in the environment that's being created for your cast as, as they're working. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's a team effort that um, I think as much as, by anyone, it's spearheaded by our producing director. And in season one, that was Marcus Siega. And in, in season two and moving into season three, it's Silver Tree. And the, the first stop is always to try and infuse as much of the idea about what we're trying to accomplish into that director as possible. 
um, because she tends to be the person who starts and finishes the season and also is prepping with all of the other directors and frequently on set to kind of help if there's something complicated. So um, I think when you're running a show where you're trying to accomplish storytelling that's a little bit on a couple of levels, it's a bit meta the way that this one is, it's sort of, it's on me to be able to put this into words, not only in a way that a director can um, metabolize and create visual imagery around, but also that it sort of starts a chain reaction that most important is a, a conversation with an actor. And, you know, we can be talking about burning down the patriarchy in the writer's room all day long, but if we don't write scripts and tone the director in a way that gives our actors something that they can play, then it's just an idea. I mean, you know, we have to, it's, it's sort of our job to boil it down into things that, uh, you know, can really happen between two people in a frame. So uh, a lot of the conversations that we have are, are, I think, honestly, I think probably this is true of every show with, um, you know, it's like at the end of the day, it's like, what do these two people want in this scene? And all of the math that goes into the bigger story that we're telling, that's stuff that almost recedes into the deep background. As soon as we're looking at like, what is our work today? What is our work in this episode? It really has to be about like, what does Joe want? How is he trying to get it? What is love hiding? How is she going to keep it from Joe? And, um, you know, stuff that can be translated into human moments on a screen. Yeah. And then, Penn, I wanted to jump in by asking you a little bit about the voiceover work that you do on the show, because I know that you're actually recording that before you've even filmed the scene, so you don't necessarily have the visual map to go from. And, and I was just interested in, in what the unique challenges are in, in recording and, and setting up so much of the story in that way are for you. Um, it's really fun, in a way. Sometimes it's hard because, um, because of... Season one, I think, was harder because I was just get, I was getting into the water for the first time and play and like sometimes in that dark booth, um, it's like you're just floating in this space that is populated only by Joe's thoughts. And can you imagine what that might be? Like? <laughs> <laughs> um, so you know, uh, <laughs> I even, there's one line from season five, from episode five in season one that was cut that I just remember I was like. Oh, and it was about Peach. Um, I won't repeat it, but it, it's funny. I, I, it's like it sticks out in my mind every time somebody asks about the voiceover. I'm like, ding. Um, and now I, you know, I don't know. I find that I'm able to do it with this. Like, I, it's, it's very, it's very, it's vivid and it's like spontaneous. And I can close my eyes and just sort of like raise my hands and, and it's, it's, it's almost like like hyper acting it's supra acting it's not it's it's very much like acting but but you don't have to worry about what you're doing with your body so that's yeah. amazing in a way and and it's it's freeing and um i really enjoy it i really enjoy it e um even as i'm saying you know i think in season two what was fun is that towards the end joe is becoming he is becoming more introspective and recognizing his ways as much as he might not be able to change it. Well, I guess he, yeah, he's changing some of his habits, but, but he's, he's, he's coming into awareness. So a lot of things he was saying were very touching. I found myself able to access him and his sadness, you know, and his, and his great yearning for, for love idea and love the person. Um, his longing for his mother, you know, these things that are just very primal in us. Uh, you know, like in episode seven of season two, there's one line that, um, that is said to him uh, by one of Love's friends, played by Charlie Barnett. He, uh, he, he says, it's something so simple and amazing that is true for all of us. He's like, what does he say? He's like, you don't feel worthy of love. It's, so you I don't mean, feel it's worthy like, of love. So you don't feel worthy of love, yeah. <laughs> right. And he says it twice because he's talking about love and then love yeah. the character. And there's something about like that scene that I think sums up Joe and like my experience with him. Mm. It, it, you know, it's just like, 
at the end of the day, this stuff is true for him that is true for all of us. And I do think that's true for, for all people, no matter what. And if you're not playing real people, like how are people going to find themselves within these characters? You know, how, how are they going to relate and empathize? Um, yeah. Oh, and additionally, like, I, I just wanted to add in terms of like the process of working with Penn specifically, um, the ability to work with somebody who has far more experience than me was a great um, opportunity and a gift because there is a lot to learn and understand about the television industry, this show, like all kinds of things that, that he was able to take the time and very, um, you know, kind of without thought seemingly offer up a lot of information, encouragement um, that helped develop more clarity and something that could be very confusing and overwhelming and to be able to clear that air and to be able to not allow those things to interfere with what I love to do and what I'm there to do, which is acting in my job. I wanted to second that Penn is great and also Victoria I have to <laughs> say that like when, um, you know, when you're making a TV show, it's like, Ideally, in the best case scenario, it's a job that you have for a while. These are people who are working together for a long time. And we essentially have a core group that is working together as a team. And then we invite guests every week, guest directors, a bunch of guest actors. And within that, there are a few people who really have to be leaders in just setting the tone. And your series regular, starting with number one on your call sheet, gets to sort of make a choice about the kind of atmosphere that there's mm -hmm. going to be on set. And my experience of working on this show is that there's great generosity on our sets um, and that no matter who is in the scenes, and that always comes down from, mm. um, you know, the people who are there every day and the people who are in every episode, this feeling that actors are patient with each other and that they, um, you know, just offer whatever that person needs for their take. And I have to say that's not always the case, <laughs> speaking as someone who's worked on a few shows. Um, and so it's something I really appreciate. I'm like really excited for the day when we get to actually work together again and be on a set, you know, when that's safe to do and we're able to do that properly because it's such a pleasure to work on this show with these people. Yeah. And personally, I think a lot of the like meditative spiritual work that he does is what allows him to be so open and create that tone, which I'm so grateful for. I think about bringing that into my life when I'm in places of leadership, you know, being able to, be steady and present um, with what's happening in order to set a tone. Yeah. That's so amazing. And I hope that, that you guys are able to be on set again too, soon for season three safely. And thank you so much for taking time out of your day today to chat with us and, and connect. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank, thank, you. thank you guys. It's so good to see everybody's faces. And I really yeah. like, I, this reminded me how much, uh, how much of a joy this can be. So let's get back to work whenever we can. Mm -hmm. I'm down.